So, good morning, everyone. Um, we have two days, which sounds like quite a long time. And each day we have five hours, so it looks like quite a lot of time. But of course, with translation, 10 hours becomes five hours. This is a very interesting text we're going to look at. It's quite dense. And it goes through um, four levels. It's a very condensed statement and then a progressively more elaboration. So we will certainly cover the main points, but some of the additional commentary from Patu Rinpoche we might not cover. But if the main points are clear for you, then uh, you will be able to understand because his language is very clear. So firstly, we have to uh, get a sense of what the issue is. So I would invite you all to enter a small experiment. If you please put your hands out in front of you, just relaxed and open. And then close your hands as if you were gripping something and feel what that is like in the muscles and tendons and so on. And then relax and open. And then you can tighten again. So relaxing is not work. Relaxing occurs when you stop working. When you grasp, you are working. Work means karma. Karma means the accumulation of the effects of activity, of doing something. Well, this is the essence of Dzogchen teaching. If you can recognize how busy you are, how active you are at constructing for yourself your own limitation, then we start to see, oh, maybe this effort is not so necessary. Freedom is intrinsic. Satisfaction is intrinsic. The undivided wholeness, the integrity of uh, life is without effort. And yet when we look at our lives, we see we are very busy. We have many important things to do. So this is what we have to investigate again and again. So once we start uh, constructing our sense of our life, our friends, our work, our world, when we find uh, something of value, we want to protect it and develop it and protect it from other factors which might undermine it. And because of that, we uh, become aware of impermanence. Even the good situations that we like start to dissolve and vanish. And even the difficult situations that we try to avoid, they also vanish. Both of these realizations can turn us towards exerting more control. Impermanence is the enemy of the self because it's constantly rearranging the constituents of the self and of its environment. But when we relax and release our unnecessary involvement, we can start to see that the flow of experience the ceaseless arising and passing of phenomena is the vitality of the open ground awareness. Uh, another way of looking at this is uh, the difference between as is and as if. When we open ourselves to seeing how it is, we find that when we look for ourselves, we don't find anything uh, reliable and unchanging. That although experience is ceaseless, the basis of this experience is ungraspable, unborn, open, empty awareness. And this is the main concern of this text. However, um, with as if our <sighs> the flow of experience which arises and becomes turned around the um, imaginary point of location, which is our individual ego self. And then we are inventing. 
We are in the realm of imagination, pretending, make believe. And this is what we do all the time. And of course, this is activity. We are busy constructing our imprisonment. This insight, this clarity is the basis for the main meditation instruction in Sokshen, which is to relax and open and simply allow the arising and passing of whatever occurs. Okay, so this uh, was taught, this text was written by Pato Rinpoche, a very famous uh, Lama who lived in East Tibet in the uh, 1800s period. And in this, he gives an exposition of the three important statements of Garab Dorji. So first I'll touch on that transmission and then we'll go into looking at the text. The mind itself, that is to say, uh, the basic uh, illuminative clarity, which allows anything at all to appear, has been there from the very beginning. This is uh, the mind of the Buddha. There are no boundaries to this awareness. And this is the basis of the first transmission, which is called the uh, direct or instant transmission of the Buddha's clarity. That is to say, in its most simple empty form, what is to be transmitted cannot be transmitted. It's not a thing. So I'm looking at my computer screen and I'm speaking towards I don't know why, but I'm speaking towards a big image of myself, which will probably be quite boring by the end of the day. And this is transmitted to you. Something goes from A to B. But in the transmission of the Buddha's mind, nothing goes anywhere. The infinity of awareness, that is to say the undividedness, the unboundedness of awareness means that uh, clarity is instant. So this is uh, presented to us in the form of uh, the primordial Buddha, Kuntu Zangpo or Samantabhadra. His name means always good. However things appear, they are always good. They are good because they are empty of inherent existence. Emptiness cannot be good or bad. There is nothing there to be uh, uh, established as being better than anything else. When you look at the sea, at the waves that are arising and descending, the waves are the movement of water. In terms of the water, one wave is not better than another. They are all good, they are just water. When we look at the waves in terms of our function or our desire to be a fisherman or a surfer or a swimmer, then we make evaluation but intrinsic to the non-duality of the water and the wave, there is no basis to support our evaluation. Flowing from this direct transmission is the transmission of uh, symbols. It's called um, the symbolic transmission of those who are present in awareness. Symbol here doesn't mean the, the symbols which are sometimes used in a ritual form of transmission. It's not about mirrors or crystal balls or peacock feathers. But the symbol is light, that absolute ungraspable nothing at all is inseparable from the display of everything. The display of clear light, the potential of light to manifest all its diverse forms is not different different from the open empty ground which is emptiness. It means if you look around you, wherever you're sitting, if your eyes work, you see. What do you see? You see light. Light comes into your eye. If a table came into your eye or a teacup came into your eye, you would be very unhappy. But light comes in. You think table, you think teacup, but what you see is light. 
if you see this, this is the second level of transmission. The third level of transmission is called the spoken transmission that comes in through the ear of ordinary people. This is our situation when we study this text that we try to read and understand and apply it to our experience. The text arises as the flow of compassion of the Buddhas. The second level of transmission is represented by Vajrasattva. Vajrasattva we know in terms of tantric purification practices. The name means uh, indestructible mind or indestructible truth. And from uh, Vajrasattva, there emanate the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities, which are the basis for all the possibilities of samsara and nirvana. But if we, if we can't see this ourselves, then we have to rely on the words, the verbal instruction. And then on this level, we are having to work harder. Although our aim is to relax and open and receive, when we study and reflect on what we have understood, we are doing work. And this is a work of interpretation. That is to say, we are putting ourselves into what we are receiving, what we have learned, our capacity with languages and so on. So this is a little bit more tricky. If we don't have the light on for ourselves, if we don't know that we're a bit tricky, that we have bias and prejudice and tendencies, then it can be difficult to recognize how we can distort the teaching. We distort it not because we're bad, but because we don't recognize the particular patterning of the energy arising from the ground, which we take to be our continuing solid self. So oh, this third level of transmission comes to us from Garab Dorji. According to the tradition, he was not a, a human being, but he appeared in the form of a human being, but, but with a body of light. Of course, we actually all have a body of light. But in uh, Garab Dorji's case, when he was passing from this world, he rose into the sky and spoke from a cloud of a rainbow light. And he made these three statements, which are the focus of this text. This was received by Manjushri Mitra, who later handed them to Padmasambhava, and they come down through uh, the open lineages and the thermal lineages as well. So, we want to <coughs> look now at the text. The title is Tsiksum uh, Nedek, which means this uh, three statements um, which hit the uh, key points. This, these key points are the view, the meditation, and the conduct or uh, the nature of movement. In these uh, three statements are about who we are. We don't know who we are. We think we know who we are because we have many, many thoughts about who we are. And other people have thoughts about who we are. Some people may have nice thoughts, pleasing thoughts about who we are, and other people might not like us and have fairly negative thoughts. Because our ego self this uh, aspect of ourselves that we take to be so important and uh, so precious is in fact not different from a balloon. With a balloon, when you blow into it, it gets bigger, and when you let the air out, it gets smaller. So this is how we experience our life, inflation and deflation. People say something sweet and we feel a bit bigger, People say something cruel or hurtful and we get smaller. You might try to reinflate yourself with anger, but again, they could be more cutting towards you. And again, you start to shrink. 
the ego self is caught up in the flow, the pulsations of uh, moving out towards the world and having to receive what the world sends towards us. This situation is unstable, unpredictable, and very often quite painful. And it arises because of not knowing who we are. Now, not knowing who we are, we, we think we can understand that. You might want to know where you left your car keys. There is a subject, me, there is an object, the car keys, and there is the connection, which is, do I know where they are or do I not know where they are? But to know who we are in this sense is very different. To find out how we are, we have to let go of the notion that there is a who we are. There is somebody who is there to be known. So here again, we can see the difference between relaxed and tense, between not working and working. We construct ourselves. Other people construct us. In various government databases, they have information about us in terms of tax and health and so on. That is to say, people and agencies build up pictures of who we are. For example, if you want to get some uh, life insurance, they ask you if you smoke tobacco. If you smoke tobacco, they think you're going to die earlier, and that affects uh, the kind of insurance you can get. It, it doesn't predict how, how long you, as an individual, are going to, to live. Nobody can know that, but statistically and in terms of categories of information, they build up a picture and it, then it, it is as if you are what that picture represents. And we do this all the time, evaluating people in terms of whether they're interesting or not interesting. If they're interesting, we give, tend to give more attention. If not interesting, we give less attention. If, however, we can't get away from the person who is not so interesting, they become annoying. We feel annoyed because we don't like how we take them to be. And we take that as a sign that that is how they are. And then it's clear for us, I don't like them. So now I'm claiming a definite knowledge about this other person. I have flipped from a subjective feeling tone towards a definite knowledge about the enduring qualities and capacities of that person. And this is our life. Caught up in commentaries and storytelling about ourselves, other people, political parties, and so on. So, in order to find out who we are, we don't want to build on top of the assumptions that we already have. Our interactive consciousness, how, which is our, the aspect of our mental functioning whereby we uh, create the images and shapes and identities of what we encounter. This is very useful for functioning in a world of duality. And so it's useful to us, it's familiar to us. It's how we make sense of what is going on. But from the point of view of Sokshen, this is the creation of a fantasy realm. This is a misunderstanding of the ungraspable, illusory nature of phenomena. By grasping at illusion and taking it to be substantial and real and useful, it thickens into delusion. That is to say, the transparency of the world or the experience of the world as light and sound is solidified by our own activity into a solid experience. And most probably, no one in your family said this to you. No one at school said it. No one at work says it. Even when people are very nice to us and supportive and understanding, 
when they wish the best for us. This is done within the frame of understanding that we really exist, that we are a knowable entity. So our consciousness is, is like mental hands which grasp onto experience and by squeezing them seem to make them solid and then builds up some structure of interpretation. This is why the text begins with this uh, statement, salutation to the guru. The word guru has many different uh, usages according to the different vehicles of Buddhism. In this text, the guru is the presence of these three transmissions I talked about their presence within us, as us, the direct transmission of the Buddha's mind we find when we sit without activity, not making ourselves still, but being in as of the unchanging ground. The second transmission comes when we see that experience has no other source than this unchanging ground, which is our mind itself. And it's a third transmission. The spoken transmission is a dialogic transmission. People interact. So it's a transmission through connectivity. These three are present for us, as us. This is the view. To stay with this view is the meditation. And not to stray from this view, whatever happens is the conduct or the, the way of being in the world. These three together are the guru. The guru in Sokshen is the intrinsic uh, awareness or rikpa, the clarity of the mind. It's not something that we do. It's not something that we possess. It is us. And it is not us. So we have to find this uh, middle way between grasping at an identity, fusing into it as if there was something definite to hold on to. And on the other hand, pushing things away. That is to say, standing apart. I am me with my mind. Well, on the basis of that, I will evaluate what's important and what's not important. Without going to these two extremes, we want to sit and relax and be with whatever is occurring. At first, when we do this, we tend to see that we are caught up in a lot of interpretation. That there is a stream of commentary. This uh, commentary uh, is like a wedge which goes into the flow, the uninterrupted flow of experience and separates it into subject and object. That's how we find ourselves being. This is happening to me. I am doing this. And this position of the individual ego, our ego self, seems to be non-negotiable. It seems fundamental. The basis of me is me. I'm, I'm here. You can add things, you can make me happy, make me sad, and so on, but I'm me. So when we say salutation to the guru, it's a very English kind of statement. Because today, once again, there are many, many clouds in the sky. The guru is like the clear blue sky. And our self-construction is like the clouds. If I look out the window, I see only cloud. There is not one speck of blue. In a cloudy world, clouds are normal. And the blue sky is a nice surprise, but it won't last long. But the basis of the mind, our mind, is like a clear blue sky open, infinite, uncompounded in any way. Generally speaking, we have a duality between cloud and sky. The clouds are blocking the blue sky. I'm stuck with the clouds, so I can't see the sky. 
So when we sit in meditation and thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, many things are arising and we become caught up in them, liking and not liking, busily trying to edit and construct patterns, then we, then we are in a world of clouds. Now, intellectually, we might know oh, the blue sky is there behind the clouds, but it doesn't help us very much. We need to have the direct experience that even when the sky is full of clouds, the sky is empty and open. So when we say salutation to the Guru, we say salutation to the mind, which has no limit, which is the hospitality and the generosity of the arising of whatever occurs, the non-duality of open emptiness and appearance. In the language of Dzogchen, the non-duality of Kada, the primordial purity or the unaltered openness of awareness and Shundru, which is the instant manifestation of appearance, experience. It's when we say appearance looks outside, when you say experience maybe feels inside, but there's no difference between the two. So when salutation to the guru means even living in my cloudiness, I am not apart from the open sky of awareness, from the heart of all the Buddhas, from the Dharmakaya. Due to the delusion of trying to separate the cloud from the sky, I am so busy and always involved with clouds. But the, it is the very non-duality of appearance and emptiness, which is, which is the intrinsic liberation of all phenomena. The guru is the <clears throat> integrity of the unborn nature of our body, voice, and mind. Unborn means that when you observe your body, your voice, your mind, you don't find something that you can really hang on to. Although we can talk of them as if they were, as if they were stable entities, when we simply look and see, they are movement. We are the energy of the creativity of the ground. This is the guru. So the truth of how we are is the guru. If we stay close to how we are, the guru shows us, indeed, this is how you are. But if we may remain wrapped in our fantasies about who we are, the messages from our culture that as a man or a woman or with this sexual orientation or with this uh, culture or race, you are like this, then, the, then with that, the guru can't do anything. The power of assumptions is that they say the clouds are real and true in the blue sky. It's a fantasy. So when we say salutation to the guru, we, we give ourselves a nice relaxing out breath and we say, oh, I don't want to delude myself anymore. It's time to stop believing in clouds. Okay. <clears throat> so now we take a break for 20 minutes and come back and go into the text. <laughs> Thank you, James. Mm. Mm. So many wonderful people. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there are a few technical difficulties. Um, these are probably inevitable, and I'm sorry if it's difficult for some people to hear. The uh, amazing Brazilian team, Jao, Milton, and Pedro, who keep this moving, uh, uh, do a really good job as far as we can tell, because it's an amazing thing we can meet in this way. And each situation brings its own particular demands. We have to do our best to be present, which always means the middle way, not too tight, not too loose. We don't want to 
sort of grasp at the meaning because it will run through our fingers. But we want to absorb it so that it softens the rigidities of our character structure. So now we go into the text itself. And he says the, the view is Longchen Rabjam, infinite vastness. You may find a slight variation in what I say with the text you printed because we're always working on uh, getting the, the best translation possible. The, each language is um, a semiotic field of resonance. Each word is feeding into how we understand other words. And so when we go from Tibetan into English, uh, to find some, some terms which carry the precise uh, meaning, but also emotional quality uh, is a work in progress. It won't be completed probably for a hundred years. So in these first three lines, he is uh, paying homage to the lineage through which he received these teachings and simultaneously giving the essence of the teaching. So Longchen Bai is, uh, or Longchen Ramjam is a very famous uh, Tibetan scholar and meditator who wrote many of the foundational uh, modern uh, texts on Dzogchen. Longchen means uh, something like great depth, infinite profundity. And Ramjam gives a sense of uh, expansion, of um, uninterruptedness. This uh, ungraspable infinity, which is everywhere, is the view. So the view means uh, the way of viewing. It means like, how do we look in order that we see? So. We know how to look in order to see a tree or to see what's in the fridge. But here it means to how to look in order to see your own mind, which is this um, infinite vastness. It means we have to look with our mind at our mind. Now, <clears throat> normally, what we take to be our mind is the patterning of the content of our mind, which is arising and changing moment by moment. So if I go to the fridge to look at what's in, inside, there might be many things there which I see, but I don't feel connected with. I see some cheese, but I'm not in the mood to eat cheese. So the value of what I see is mediated by how I'm positioned in relation to the current content of what's arising for me. So that could be a sensation, something around my mouth, no, I don't want cheese. Or it could be a thought. Mm, by the sensation, I want to eat the cheese, but the cheese is made of fat and I am getting fat, so I'm not going to eat the cheese. So in that we, we see that I'm looking from a cloudy position. I'm looking from an identification with the, the flow of mental factors and that constellates the clouds of outer appearance and these two clouds play together. Now, we have a mind, that is to say, we have a capacity for uh, illuminating experience. And this experience comes and goes. So when we are fixated on the content of experience, we are interested in the particularity of our current self-construct, which determines the focus and intensity of our looking. Now, <clears throat> That's how samsara is maintained. That's how we keep turning round and round, immersed in the flow of experience without recognizing it. So 
what we want to do is to look with the mind at the mind itself. The mind itself is the source of the content of the mind. It doesn't mean that it's like a factory pumping out stuff, but rather we, without the, the mind itself, there would be no content of the mind. So the view, the way of viewing is infinite vastness and what is viewed is infinite vastness. In some of the texts, it talks about meditating sky to sky. Okay, the mind itself is open like the sky. You can't catch it. It's not made of anything, although it shows many, uh, as it were, contents, or it shows many events or happenings. And we are used to taking these momentary events as ingredients for the construction of our interpretation about what is happening. But when we simply sit, as we will do later, we find that what is occurring is movement. It's not that one thing is happening after another thing, but the thingness of the seeming thing is created by interpretation. What is flowing is this and this and this and this. Immediate revelation, but not of something. It's the revelation of nothing. This nothing is cut up, the primordial purity of the mind. Primordial purity means that it's never touched or contaminated or um, marked in any way just arising and passing and this brings us to a kind of crisis because there's nothing for us to do this has been there from the very beginning the ceaseless flow of the display of nothing and the sense of self as an observer as a commentator is a false positioning that seems to place us outside of the flow. Sometimes it's as if we are a neutral observer, but we are still a neutral observer of things. The rarefication, the objectification, the making of things out of empty appearances goes on unrecognized. So the ego, although it seems to be very active and involved, is difficult to grasp because it's always hiding. And it has to hide. Because when you see the ego, it is movement. There's nothing solid, enduring, fixed, reliable there. But because you don't see it, you imagine it. And you imagine it to be something. And you can never check out whether it really is something because you only imagine it. But you know that you're not mad to imagine it because everyone else does it. You are enjoying ordinary delusion, normative delusion. And so we believe in something which is not there. And that believing is a mental activity. Again, we're back with activity doing, making, compounding, constructing. This is the unnecessary activity which creates the veil that stops us seeing the mind with the mind itself. So we, when we sit to do meditation practice, we're not trying to develop something. We don't, we're not trying to improve our mind. We just seeing and at first our seeing is mixed with interpretation as we seem to add value to what is occurring but when you see for yourself the consequence of doing this you are thickening something which is light and the, here light is in both senses in english 
It's both the light that we see as uh, coming with our eyes, but it's also light in the sense of uh, something insubstantial. So how do we view from infinite vastness? And we have to recognize the difference between finite and infinite. Finite finitude is established across different dimensions so uh, a kilometer is finite uh, in terms of distance and the kilogram is finite in relation to the possibility of weight and an hour is also finite in relation to time we all know how to talk about hours and kilograms and kilometers. These are conventional terms. They function because we are willing to believe in their validity. They are not intrinsic. They are imposed or introduced. So when you just spend a little time quietly with yourself and observe your mental activity, see how much work goes into constructing what you believe in you select from the field of possibilities you allocate value and then you believe in the importance of what you have established so this is all activity this is not the meaning of presence presence is just here it's not doing anything it's revealing, just as we see with the mirror, the mirror reveals what is put there in front of it. The mirror doesn't have to work hard to make an image. The image is instantly there and it's not built up in pieces. But our mental activity, our compounding, which is the basis of the structures within which we act as subject on object, this requires a lot of effort. So the key point of the view is that it's not something you do. It's not something you're trying to do to establish a better way of existence for yourself. By observing the seductive invitations of what is arising, and recognizing how dangerous they are, you can see the dangers. There is always a shadow. This lovely person who is offering sex is also offering syphilis. And this is the same for us. These thoughts, feelings, sensations, which seem to offer meaning, something of value, sooner or later reveal uh, that they are attacking the very structure of our present life. Now we become prisoners of the virus, but we live in a world of infection. The subject infects the object with an illusory sense of reality. And the object as the manifestation of this illusory sense of reality confirms to the subject its own illusory sense of reality. So you have a continuous mutual infection, reinfection going on. Now with the virus, we are advised to observe social distancing. Now you might decide then, okay, I'll go and do a retreat in a cave. But unfortunately, when you get to the cave, you brought the virus with you. This cave, which is a hole in the side of the hill, is now my cave. Yeah, so don't come into my cave. And I need to put, have a place to put my bag of uh, food. So this is the store corner. And now we have the sleeping corner. So the virus of my mind is, can infect mountains, seas, anything. And the key thing is to see this is all activity. This is the movement of the mind interpreting what is arising in order to establish a stability 
which unfortunately it can never accomplish. So the view is your own mind from the very beginning <clears throat> has been completely open and available and hospitable. Whatever comes, goes. What we take to be fixed entities are in fact conceptual elaborations. The actuality of phenomena of appearances is that they are dynamic and moving. So here you are at a crossroads. One road is to relax and trust the openness. The, my mind is naturally open, that's what I need. On the other hand, <clears throat> we can take the pathway of the individual ego self. I need the things which bring happiness. I don't need the things which don't bring happiness. I am a thing that needs things. Now, this is a belief structure we've all been carrying for a very long time. You can see when we have a break and you go around in your uh, flat or you go outside for a little, you see how you, you see how absolutely convincing it is that you see things. There seems to be a self-evident truth that a car is a car. A dog is a dog. So that when I say, oh, <clears throat> it, the dog appears as a dog because of your mental activity of constructing the dog, that sounds like madness because the dog just is. So it, it is on this point <clears throat> that you see the invisibility of the ego, that it hides within what it has created. The dog exists for me as a dog because of my perception. If a snake sees the dog, it won't see it in terms of my frame of reference. I can't imagine what the snake sees in the appearance that I refer to as a dog. The snake has a snake world experience. And we have a human world experience. <clears throat> so when we <clears throat> start to read about the six realms of samsara, we study this in order to see the relativity of our positioning. The dog for a human is a dog for a human. It's not a dog for a dog. The number of human beings who are interested in sniffing the arse of a dog is probably very small. But it's an activity very popular for dogs. Because the world is revealed according to these parameters. For dogs and for humans. We see, oh, there is no intrinsic truth in what seems so real and substantial and given in my experience. So when you start to look at your world in this way, you are loosening up the texture of the tapestry of your assumptions. And the reason this is uh, very important is because the belief in truly existing entities blinds us to the nature of activity and movement. So in Dzogchen, we are concerned with stillness and movement. We know what is movement. Buses and birds move around through space. But the bus in itself remains a bus, whether it's parked or going at 50 kilometers an hour. The busness of the bus doesn't seem to move, although the bus is moving. So what is this busness of the bus? This is my interpretation. Even when the bus is not moving, the fact that I see it as a bus is the movement of my mind. The stability of the object is the movement of the mind. So this is something to chew a lot 
It's not something to swallow. You have to really chew on it. Because my mind is moving, the world seems full of stable, reliable things. The stillness of the object is a delusion created by the movement of the mind. And as long as we believe in the stability of objects, of entities, these, uh, these become very thick, dark clouds. They are impenetrable. If I didn't know that a bus was a bus, I, I, there would be something wrong. I should be in a mental hospital. It's obvious because it's a fact. But in fact, from the point of view of Dharma, it is a fiction. It is a construct according to our embodiment as humans, our cultural assumptions, the development of the internal combustion engine and so on. So the reason for explaining uh, in this way is to help us to see the subtle forms of movement which generate a false stillness or stability. And because we want there to be stable entities, because the seeming stability of the object confirms the seeming stability of the subject, this is in the shadow. We don't want to see how mental activity is constructing our world. That is to say, our commitment to believing in the truth and value and utility of transient mental phenomena becomes a problem in meditation. We may think that we are primar <coughs> excuse me, primarily interested in the qualities that we see as being inherent in the object, but our real interest, our hidden interest, is that the somethingness of the object confirms the somethingness of the subject. So this is what we experience when we sit to do meditation. We experience distraction. We follow after thoughts, feelings, sensations, and so on. They don't even have to be very fascinating. The subject needs something to hold on to. It, it holds on to the fantasy, the delusion of inherent existence in what is arising. So what uh, Padre Bhakti is pointing to here is the view is infinite vastness. The viewing mind is infinite without limit and without any fixed content. What is seen, what is viewed is also infinite without any fixed content. The viewer awareness doesn't change. This is stillness. This is intrinsic stillness. From the very beginning, the illumination of the ground by the ground is simply there. So when we Cat, seem to try to catch a thought in the meditation. We're grasping at a cloud as if we could apprehend it. Or we're grasping at a wave as if we could take it out of the ocean. What appears is the display of openness. In traditional Buddhist understanding, ignorance or ignoring is not to see the inseparability of appearance and the ground of appearance. Rather, we ignore this open, infinite, vast ground and hold on to the finite. The finite doesn't exist because it is simply a, a contour or a, a turn of the infinite. All finites are within the infinite, but the infinite is not summative of the finites. You don't get to the infinite by adding up all the finites. So the infinite is beyond totalization. 
So before the break, we looked at how consciousness, that is to say, the quality of our mental capacity. So it, it seeks to apprehend uh, the apprehendable. I am conscious of something. So consciousness, mental consciousness, I'm thinking about what I did yesterday, allows me to imagine that yesterday is something existing. But of course, yesterday is gone. It's not available anywhere except in my belief. So awareness is different from consciousness. Awareness simply reveals, it doesn't apprehend, it doesn't take as real what it displays. So in summary, the view is that our mind, our mind as it actually is, has been open from the very beginning. It's not a thing. And it doesn't need any so-called things. Relaxed, hospitable, it reveals what is arising and passing. It's not required to do something, to make something. And so it's relaxed. Life goes on but it's not doing it. So, Flundru is the effortless arising, the instant manifesting of all the qualities of the potential of the ground without the least effort from the ground. And the cuckoo in the nest is ignorance, reification, objectification, belief in inherent existence. And baby cuckoos are very good eaters. They push the other eggs out of the nest. Everything is for me. So we don't want to be a cuckoo. From the very beginning, we are Buddha. So Buddhas don't die. They're relaxed and happy. And cuckoos are born and die. So this is something to think about the basic existential choice. Okay, then we come back after lunch at 20 to two. Thank you, James. Good. Thank you for the translation and thank you for the organization and we have a break. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so <clears throat> we've been going, we're going through the the three words, the view, meditation, and activity. Because the, the title, uh, the three statements that hit the key points is also the three words that hit the key points. So it's referring both to the three words, that the view and so on, and also to the three statements by Garab Dorji will come to soon. So then he says, the meditation is Kinsi Wazir, rays of knowledge and love. This was a vision of Jigmi Lingpa, uh, who saw uh, Longchen Rabjan very clearly and received many teachings from him. So it's, it's about the continuity of that lineage. So although the ground is never moving, from it come rays uh, of knowledge and love. Now, this uh, knowledge here means knowledge of the ground. It doesn't mean knowledge of the, ops the items we find in the world. It's not knowledge about something, but direct knowledge of our presence as both the ground and the rays arising from it. So, for example, when you look around you, in your room, wherever you are at the moment, uh, you, you have the, the sense of um, events occurring, but different kinds of perception. And what presents comes in these two ways. First, simply, directly, just this. And then as a kind of excess exuberance, there comes the interpretation. When maybe we see a book and think, oh, I must uh, get, give myself some time to read that. So 
in that way, knowledge is uh, bringing in factors to create some sense of intention. Now, when direct knowledge of the ground is in place, and we see that all thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, plans are the movement of the energy of the ground. And in that moment, we are present as the awareness of the ground. Then what is arising seemingly as interpretation or even as allusion to something seemingly substantial and real is not a problem. If you go to the cinema and you see in the film someone being murdered, no one is murdered. It's a film. In the same way, everything is empty. In the, in the film, in the movie, no one is killed. But if the director and the actors are good, you get a shock. The illusory nature of the film and the intensity of our willingness to believe in illusion come together and we have a, some strong experience. This is why it is so essential, first of all, to be clear about the view and to bring all of life into the openness of the view. For example, here in London, the sky is still full of, full of clouds. So if I look out at the clouds, I, uh, this, the sky and the sun is hidden for me by the clouds. The clouds are an obstacle. And generally speaking, in Buddhist practice, this is how we behave. We have our Buddha nature, but we are not quite in contact with it. It remains as a kind of potential, but uh, kept somewhere safe. And what we encounter are our cloud-like obscurations and confusions. And then we learn we can do purification exercises. If only I can thin the clouds enough, then I will see the sky. Now. This faces us with a real question. Are clouds finite in their supply chain? If you've been cooking something and you burned a little bit on the bottom, you can keep cleaning the, the pan till all the burnt charred food comes off the pan. But what about all the crap that's in your mind? Is it a limited quantity? If you clean your mind today, how do you know you won't get more shit tomorrow? Well, mind, when it has a tendency to be complicatedly involved in uh, pattern formation, uh, becomes obscured very easily. So, although there are many, many developmental paths in Buddhism, Lamrim paths and so on, uh, the outcome is quite uncertain. The, the text may say, if you practice this, then in seven years, in after seven lifetimes, you will gain full enlightenment. There is a small, uh, there is an extra sentence in very small typescript written by the Buddha's lawyer. This statement is dependent upon the presence of good facilitative conditions. We don't know what's going to happen. All kinds of things interrupt our life. Therefore, now in this life, we need to work out our relation with the sky and the clouds and ourselves. We can simplify it a little bit. Instead of having three things, the sky, the clouds, and me, we can see, oh, there is no inherent existence to myself. So now we just have the sky and the clouds. So do you want to be the sky or the cloud? That's simple. If you become the cloud, you won't see very much. If you become the sky, you see that the cloud is in the sky, but the sky is still the sky even with the cloud inside. 
heavy storm clouds don't make the sky a bad place. Light fluffy clouds don't make the sky more beautiful. Under all these conditions, the sky is the sky. So from the point of the view, we are the sky. Primordial purity. In the meditation then is to see that whatever arises are the rays of direct knowledge and uh, love or kindness. The direct knowledge is the emptiness of the ray. The love is the illuminative capacity of the ray, that there is appearance, that there is vitality, it's not just the big empty hole. Moreover, the vitality of the mind in the simplicity of emptiness is very relational. What do I see? <clears throat> I see the light of the ground. That's what I see. However, if I think, oh, these people are a different race or from a different country or are my enemies, this hides the quality of the ray of the ground and becomes biased and partial and reificatory. This thickening arises from not being present in and as the ground. So it's very important again and again to return to the ground. The ground is uncompounded. It's self-presenting, it's just it is. It, is, it has no limit in duration, size, in any quality at all. And that then brings us to this uh, fact of there's nothing to take hold of there. How it is, is beyond speech, beyond expression. We have to directly enter into this. In the fifth quality of the ground is it's free of uh, being placed in the categories of samsara or nirvana, of uh, entrapment or liberation. So this is the ground of our being. We are present here, arising from this openness. So when you see, you see the beauty of the ground. Everything is the display of the ground. You can call this a tree or a house or a child. These words as they arise in your mind or from your voice are also the rays of the ground. So if I say to you, that child really likes playing with the ball. This is connectivity. There is me, the person I'm with, the child, the trees, the ball, the wind, all is moving together. Nothing is born. That is to say, nothing comes into true existence. You say child doesn't create a self-existing entity. The child is a pattern of movement in the space of movement. The child eats and sleeps without nourishment and warmth and company, they will get sick and die. They are a pattern of interaction, as are we, as is the tree, as is the wind. All is moving together. There are no separate entities. So this is the meaning of the meditation, is whenever you get trapped in strong conceptualization, when you come to a firm conclusion, this is terrible, I hate this. We have to catch movement, the intensity of feeling, this is terrible, seems to freeze something, seems to establish the, the reality, this is terrible, but it is movement. It's the movement of words. And this movement is a flow, and it doesn't stop, and it doesn't establish anything. 
So when you see this, there is no interruption. These rays are flowing all the time. Then thirdly, the activity is Jawinugu, the offspring of the victorious ones. Nugu means a kind of a sprout or a shoot coming out from the ground. It's the expression of the Buddha. This is our behavior. What does this mean? It means moment by moment as we move in the world, whatever we're doing, our connectivity is imbued with the quality of the Buddha's mind. Now you might think, no, but I am walking, I am thinking, I am cooking. Can you walk without commentary? Can you talk without commentary? Of course. The commentary is a thief. It steals the, the movement which is occurring as the energy of the Buddha. It steals it. In, and claims it to be a personal private agency. <clears throat> I am doing it. That is a thought. The thought arises in my mind and then it vanishes. The thought is not making the activity. For example, if you like coffee with hot milk, and you're heating the milk in a pan and it starts to bubble up and it's going to come over and make a bad smell. You grab the handle of the pan and lift it off the heat. Who did that? The seeing did that. You see it and the activity arises through you. This is the, how non-duality functions. There is no clear final separation between self and environment. So you, you hear the sound and you see it, oh, and the pan is up. If you stop to think about it, the milk will already have boiled over. We have all experienced this kind of event many times in our lives. But in order to maybe tell someone else about what happened, we elaborate the story. So we bring a commentary into the event through the back door. The commentary is not required. Something occurred and that was over. Occurred, that was over. But what will I talk about? I have to come home and, and tell my friends something that happened today. Otherwise, I'm a very boring person. I have to be entertaining. Why? They need entertainment. Why? Because they don't know who they are. If we go back to the first uh, transmission, the Jawa Gombigyut, the mind of all the Buddhas has no separation. It's not that there is just one mind or many different minds. There is immediate uh, being with whatever is occurring. They don't need to tell someone about it because it's already here. If you go to a, an art gallery and you're looking at a painting, you probably don't need someone giving you a commentary in your ear. We get the commentary when we can't see. If you see the painting gives itself fully to you, endlessly, freshly, every time you look at it, no need for any commentary. The commentary kills the painting. It smears it with interpretation as if you were putting black paint all over it. So we don't need to comment on everything. But if we see the rays of connectivity moving out, we can be with them in their simple necessary formation. And as our activity moves out, as it feels that I am the one doing this, we are like blossoms of the Buddha, shining out in different forms, different shapes, moment by moment. Our ground is open and empty. The field of our movement is clarity. 
pervade it with uh, love and kindness. We, this can uh, say, it say well, can, we could also call it tenderness, as if you were holding a small baby in your arms. You're not squeezing it. The child of four, they might like to be squeezed. But with a small baby, you're very tender. Everything is soft around the baby. And there's something about the baby's face that keeps you looking and looking. Oh. So this tenderness is the quality of the field of appearances. When we are doing and making, we exhibit uh, a quality of violence. Chopping carrots is quite a violent activity. I'm interested in carrot for me. I'm not interested in carrot for carrot. I bought the carrot in the carrot slaves market. And now I'm chopping it up for my purposes. No, this is agency. This is activity. I make the world the way I want it. But with tenderness. We are adapting to how it is. Now, clearly, there is a, a, a pulsation or a spectrum between mastery over circumstances, control over circumstances, and uh, passive adaptive receptivity, which is imbued with tenderness. This uh, passive adaptive tenderness is not the same as being bullied by other people or uh, being under their power. We need to have the whole spectrum of possibility and then working with circumstances, according to circumstances, energy manifests in the way with the optimal fit. So when we get up from the meditation mat, and we're moving in the world, either on our own or with others, we're in an environment which already is presenting itself to us. We are the energy of the ground moving in the field of the energy of the ground. In this sweet openness, the tight nexus of ego self dissolves. Now, you might be worried that uh, this uh, vast openness is uh, going to be overwhelming. Uh, I won't be able to cope with it. It'll make me mad. It will be a kind of trauma which is hitting me. Okay. <clears throat> who is the one who is having the experience? If it is me, just me, this cloud called me, then I alone as this autonomous entity, this finite form with my limited capacity will of course feel overwhelmed. This is why we have awakened to the ground. We're just laying out the territory at this point. But if you start to see for yourself, I am not a thing. Because if I was a fixed thing, how come I'm so changed from my childhood? So I am a changing interactive potential. What is the essence of this potential? Emptiness. What is its manifestation? However, I am moment by moment, according to circumstances. There is no substantial essence to anything. The essence of everything is unborn emptiness. Emptiness means not finite, not a thing. It means open, shining, radiant. So <clears throat> by settling into openness, everything can be managed. But if you try to consolidate yourself, you will have a lot of troubles. All over the world, people are losing the environment that they live in. In Brazil, the madness of the destruction of the rainforest continues very quickly. People are forced to become somebody else. 
because who they were living in the jungle was a particular dialogue with a fixed state. In order to come out of the jungle, you have to leave your tradition. But for all of us, to more, to greater or lesser extent, we are our traditions. Family traditions, gender traditions, national traditions, religious traditions. I am British. It's a kind of uh, meaningless term. What is it to be British? The only is meaningful if I say, well, I'm not French. What would, what would being British mean? I'm a British Republican who doesn't like the Queen. But you can't really be British and not love the Queen. I am a bad British, a substandard British. There you can see these kind of categories, are, they are so vague, you can put anything into them, which is why nationalism is so dangerous having no shape of its own, it can devour any fuel available. And the self is just like that. It's a fabrication. There's no intrinsic truth of its own. It's a lie, a deception. But as we know, many of the most powerful dictators in the world are in their position due to lying and cheating. We may not be world dictators, but we also lie and cheat to maintain this illusion of ourselves. So when we see how much activity is corralled, is taken into the service of maintaining the delusion of an individual self, a self which must ceaselessly reinvent itself because it doesn't actually exist, then we see how busy we are. So when we see my activity is a shoot or an expression of the Buddha, there is no self-referential turn in it. What I call me is this expression of the energy of the Buddha's heart. We are all apparitions or magical appearances of the Buddha. And in that way, the infinite expansion of the ground is not a threat. But as long as you are committed to being a finite entity, you will feel tension. If I am something, becoming nothing is like death. There will be fear. But through the practice, something becomes nothing, becomes everything. Because actually we talk to different people in different ways, we perform many hundreds of different kinds of activity every day. I am not a thing. I am an idea. What kind of idea? I'm the idea that I am a thing. And what happens to ideas? They vanish very quickly. This is what meditation is, to stay with your mind until you see that there is ceaseless movement of experience arising and passing. And that awareness, the awareness of that movement never changes. Ungraspable awareness, like the sky, is indestructible. And the delusion of the ego is self-dissolving moment by moment. So if we stay present with these two factors, there is nothing to fear. But if you hold on to the idea that you exist as an enduring ego essence, then probably you have a lot of suffering. That's what the Buddha taught many, many times. Then Padre Bhatti says, if you practice in this way, you will be a Buddha in this life. And if not, at least you will be happy. Alala. No. Oh. By... <clears throat> entering into the view, refining it through sitting in the meditation so that it becomes more to more clear to you and having it as the basis of your conduct or behavior in the world, you will be the living presence of Buddha. 
and you will awaken to this in this very life because it's not far away it is intrinsic it it is what has always been the case it is always already here it is delusion which is a construct the buddha mind is just how it is and he said even if you don't fully awaken you will at least you will be very happy this is the happiness of not being afraid of death where you really see all outer and inner phenomena what we take to be outer and inner are ceaselessly moving and so like putting your hand into the river and trying to get a handful of water and just getting a wet hand in the same way you see when you push yourself into the flow of experience and try to get something you just get the slimy remnant of the thought the thought is gone you get an echo a trace so then we don't need to try and grasp if it's ungraspable why are we grasping but it's not what i want that is a thought if when it arises it feels like a fundamental truth for you if you think listen i've been alive some time i know what i like i want this i don't want that if this feels like the truth for you then you are merging into the thought this is where you're very vulnerable you have abandoned clarity for the momentary kind of cuddle of fusion into whatever is arising. And then it's gone, always going. So I like this. The thought. It's not the truth about me. Me is also a thought. Me woven with this thing i like this thing i don't like creates the construction weaves the blanket of self there is no self so when we do meditation practice and we do some later we're just sitting movement is occurring don't move with the movement it's just moving it would be like if you if you are at a at a party or a gig and as the band comes on and they, you like their music and you find your body starting to move to the rhythm and you just don't move now listen to the music then start to move so how is the music when you move to the music and how is the music when you are still when you don't move there's a little more perspective when you move you start to fuse in with the rhythm you feel it coming right through your body so you can do that kind of experiment for yourself in the break or whenever you put on some music and see how it is in the practice we don't move the facts are very simple awareness doesn't move if you're moving with the movement of your mind you're not in awareness so let the movement move and stay relaxed and open okay so we take a break now and when we come back at three o'clock there is an international meditation for tibet so we will have a five minutes of quiet sitting at three o'clock and then continue with the text okay so if we're going to take a little uh, time think a little bit about the suffering in tibet people who have lost their freedom to do dharma practice the way they want the loss of uh, freedom is uh, quite terrible we, the ego expresses itself through its capacity to make choices i like this i don't like that when your country is invaded and you're under the power of other people they don't want you to make the choices you make you want they want you to conform to their idea of who you should be 
all over the world, there are people who lose their territory due to various kinds of colonial invasion, wars, and so on. So many people who find that the country they grew up in is no longer their country. And then becoming a, a refugee, they arrive in another country, which is not their country. On the level of our identity as a human being, these events are tragic. But they are also indicators of the instability of any compounded formation. When the Buddha says all compounded things are impermanent, he's pointing not just to the geography of the world, to the melting of uh, glaciers and so on, but to cultural formations. That when we really believe in something, this belief uh, tends to indicate our idea that because it's important, it will continue. So when we think of the suffering in, in Tibet, we are thinking also of all the suffering in samsara. It has the same cause, the meeting of two contradictory forces. The Chinese think that Tibet belongs to them, so they have a desire to make use of all the natural resources there. And they have a, an antipathy or an aversion to the people who resist their belief in their own entitlement. And then from the other side, when people think this is my country, my valley, my family have lived here for many, many hundreds of years. This attachment is also a great cause of suffering. So wish all beings to experience equanimity in the face of all the turbulence of life. And in order to promote this, we also have to experience equanimity in ourselves. So now we just sit in a relaxed, easy way with our skeleton carrying our weight and allow the mind to unfold however it does. If some phenomena arise that seem interesting, let them come and go. If some phenomena arise that uh, seem difficult, let them come and go. Be open to how it comes. So wh <clears throat> when we see how difficult this is to do, then we have to think when we say, may all beings be happy, uh, maybe our words are empty. We have to find the power and the clarity which allows us to be in unshakable equanimity which is the gift of awareness okay so we just sit with open awareness okay so this is a very uh, simple practice to do but it goes to the heart of the issue it lets you see whether you are getting involved in what is occurring or whether, like a mirror, you can just let it come and go. Sometimes in relation to Dzogchen, it can be a little bit, um, our practice can be a bit ethereal, a bit, too, uh, a bit too fine, too much focus on space. And that can be a, a way of uh, avoiding the, the dull stupidity of our own egoic state. As long as you're caught up in an ego formation, feeding lots of judgments and opinions, uh, you're making karma, you're making patterns which will lead to more involvement later. So, just as a, you might go to the doctor and they would palpate you, they would press you to see where there was some pain, so we have the practice of exchange or tonglen, where we say, whenever I am happy, I will give all my happiness to others. Whenever I am sad, I will take the sadness and suffering of all beings into myself. Or well, you can try that in relation to Tibet. May you have safety and security. May you have friends and uh, jobs so you can have money, May I be homeless. 
may I be impoverished. May I be vulnerable. Clearly in samsara, many people are. So why not me? In the Mahayana tradition, they say, put the other first. Let the other win. You have the good things, I'll take the bad. So if you do that quietly on your own, it will let you see exactly where your ego is. At a certain point you think, oh, oh, I don't like this. You have my health, I'll have your cancer. Uh, no, no, maybe not. It's like that. Then we think, okay, no, there is me first, me first, me first. This is why they say, well, if you are serious about your meditation practice, you see that uh, difficult situations really are your main helper. Because when you have loneliness and sadness and sickness or unemployment, and you want to distract yourself with alcohol or amusement or nonsense, or even with meditation, just sit in your sadness, sit in the loneliness, really feel how this is. You won't die. Many people have to live like this. If you can inhabit limitation and find the freedom within the limitation, then it becomes possible to make the brave words of the Bodhisattva vow. So now we continue with the text. And he says, uh, the view is infinite vastness, which we've looked at. He says, hit the key points of meaning of the three statements. This view, this seeing that the, the ground or the basis of the source of your present existence, as you take it to be, is nothing other than the heart mind of all the Buddhas. So, he says, first allow your mind to rest at ease. In the Tibetan text, it uses an active form of the verb for allowing your mind to rest at ease. But it's maybe easier for us to understand. We say, don't agitate your mind. The whole situation of the mind is relaxed and open. It tenses under the power of dualistic provocation. So how do I tense myself up? It can be tense with anxiety, with fear, with excitement, with hope. Our body changes if you, with little children and they want something. Can we? Let's do that. Oh, come on. You see, they become very excited and aroused. This is better than that. Let's do this. Well, from very early age, children are very aware of allocating value to phenomena in the world and then choosing the things that give them most pleasure and least pain. So it's not just about allowing yourself to relax because we have many subtle levels of agitation. If your daily pattern of living is very agitated, if you have many responsibilities and you experience um, other people behaving in ways which are very upsetting for you, then meditation is quite difficult. So these three aspects of the view, the meditation, and the activity are linked together. The activity is not to take things too seriously. So that when we come to sit, we are not overexcited. Equanimity means good things happen, bad things happen. It's not that we don't care, but there is a kind of meaningless caring. If there is nothing to be done, there is nothing to care about. That might sound very cruel. All the poor children in the Yemen, now they have many landmines and so on, the children are having their legs blown off. But for me to be crying about the fate of these children will not give safety and remove all the landmines. 
in this world there are so many terrible things happening so many horrible situations you could respond to oh we need to be helpful as much as we can but there is no benefit to agitating yourself in situations where you are powerless this doesn't help other people and it doesn't help you because the principle of activity is connectivity and you actually connect with people in a way that makes a difference so disempowering agitation is not ethical because if you get burnt out thinking about situations which are disturbing but where you can't help how are you going to be able to help the situations where you could actually do something useful oh this is not magic this kind of thinking it comes from just observing yourself as nam kai norbu said so many times you have to observe your own capacity work with your capacity so when he says here first allow your mind to rest at ease this is an invitation to review how your life is structured some people have quite an anxious temperament a tendency to worry and they have to stop and think what in what way has my worry my years of worry improved my life or the life of others i'm throwing my life energy away like somebody opening their wallet and throwing their euros into the air what am i doing why am i doing anxiety is doing depression is doing it may feel that like it's doing to you but it's doing so in order to find this being at ease and relaxation don't get involved involved means spiraling inwards turning revolving in an inward direction you bind yourself into a situation you say it's really important it's important for you today nothing is real that's difficult but it's important yeah it's important and not real unborn from the very beginning devoid of inherent self nature all the tragedies of the world are impactful they have an energetic consequence but that doesn't make them solid or real all compounded phenomena arise from causes so this is more general buddhist understanding but <clears throat> excuse me if you follow that line you see everything has long histories of interaction crisis situations arise as the many complex vectors of energetic arousal meet together so equanimity means not being blind to difficulties not being excited by happiness but just staying calm and open to whatever is occurring that's the background for our meditation because in this kind of practice we don't sit for a long period of time we're not trying to achieve something to make something happen but rather to relax into the intrinsic openness which is always already the ground of of how we are so he says free of thought neither dispersing nor gathering free of thought doesn't mean that there are no thoughts but you are free of the thoughts if you don't get involved temptations provocations afflictions will not vanish they are there if you have been using heroin for 20 years and you stop it doesn't mean that no one is going to be selling heroin in your town the possibility is there but if you are clear you don't use heroin there is no heroin heroin comes into existence by your involvement the object the power of the object is the gift of the subject so if you don't give your power to the object it doesn't have power so this is what the meaning of free of thought 
when you see thoughts come and go, come and go, come and go, nothing to do with us. I don't need these thoughts. So <clears throat> neither dispersing means not following the, the trajectory of a thought into some elaboration, nor gathering yourself back together in a, in a fixed position. The thoughts will seem to disperse and to gather, but we are not doing that. We have to remember the mind of involvement and the open mind are not two different things. The mind of involvement is the mind of openness when the mind of openness is not open to itself. Of course, that's a paradox because uh, the, the mind of openness is always open. But you can see for yourself when you become small, when you worry about something or you find yourself falling in love or you can't stop thinking about someone or you're really pissed off with your boss. It is as if you have poured yourself into the shape of that thought formation and then it's gone and something else comes, something else comes. And I'm here in this new moment. What I was merged into has gone. So while I was merged in it, this feels like me. I love you, I need you, I want you. I'm sure we know what that feels like. And then we're thinking about making a sandwich. This life is always changing. So in that way, while you are the center of my world, I feel I would do anything for you. Mm, but first I have my sandwich. If you observe your mind, you see it is like this. This is confluence. This is how subject and object merge together and then separate with a kind of confusion. So <clears throat> these invitations to involvement are always present in the mind. But here we just <clears throat> see, oh, it's like a potential. The power is always in the subject. It's not in the object. <clears throat> Some people can keep a bottle of whiskey in their house for two years. While other people, when they buy the bottle, they put it on the table and somehow their hand is opening the top. The bottle has no power to make the fingers move around around and take the top off. The power is in the subject, but it feels like it's in the object. So the first part of our freedom is to see, I put my life energy into the object. So this is the meaning of the dispersing. We, we, we get carried away because we give ourselves into the object that carries us. Oh, then he says, um, when resting in a state of equanimity, completely at ease, means you're just sitting. It means finding yourself free of excess or lack. When we have excess, we want to get rid of something. When we have lack, we want to get hold of something. This is fine. Just like this. In a consumerist capitalist economy, this is very difficult. We are so used to using the potential of the object to shift the state of the subject. You can use a, the apps on a mobile phone to distract yourself, to give you a game to play and so on. That, is a mean, that means I can do something. I am the captain of my ship. I can make life happen on my terms. From the Dharma point of view, this is delusion. And it is the fantasy of mastery which feeds the idea that the ego can be in charge. So then, uh, completely at ease, we enter into the practice. And here the practice is one of the 
<clears throat> the sims in the ways of uh, showing the mind itself. And we use the loud uh, sound of pet arising from our belly and going straight through us out of the top of our head. So this is very forceful. It's uh, sharp and focused and intense. But it's not against yourself. You're not attacking yourself. You're not trying to destroy bad thoughts. The clouds are in the sky. But as long as I'm on this side, I can't see the blue sky. So in a sense, the pet is like a rocket going up through you and takes you into the open sky. What we need is the direct experience of the mind itself. Not mind mediated through pet. So, you sit in a vertical way. When we relax, the energy which is located in the nadis, in the little uh, pathways in our body, gathers in the two main side channels. These uh, two channels, uh, they are, they are uh, channels of polarity. Male, female, hot, cold, right, wrong, good, bad. They exist as pulsation. And we, we know that our mood is moving between these points always. So when we really relax, the energy goes from these side channels into the center channel. The central channel is the avaduti, the, the site of emptiness in the body. So what we're doing is we're relaxing and integrating the pulsations of duality, of separateness, either or, into the space in which they move together without conflict. So before we, we do the practice, we could imagine running right from the top of your head right down to uh, the base uh, between your genitals and your anus, there is an empty tube, very narrow, like a straw. In this, this uh, tube is completely empty. Then you imagine it expanding out in all directions. Oh, everything is inside it. Everything is inside emptiness. The whole of your body, the room that you're sitting in, the street that you live in, you can take it right out, in the whole of Europe or wherever you are, in the whole of the planet, the universe. And then you bring it together again, gradually the tube is getting smaller and smaller. Everything is inside emptiness. We have to remember we're not dismantling reality. Reality is a delusion. It doesn't exist. It's like a, a mirage. Now a drunk man is looking at a mirage. Double confusion. So this is reality. This is the world of hard, concrete, separate objects. The, the basis of the reality of all the phenomena in the world is the mind. Oh, we can relax, open and close, open and close. It's very nice to do if you're sitting in a cafe, just open and close. Everything is empty. No hurry. So now everything is empty, everything is movement. And then you can do what he's saying. You suddenly strike your mind with the sound of pet. Okay, so when it says strike your mind, it means that <clears throat> this forceful sound of pet should fill everything so that everything else is blanked out. And in that way, with you as pet, you strike your mind, you are open. And we're not shouting pet from the throat. Otherwise, you get strain your throat. You, you want to have the sense of this rising right through you. And then after the pet, you sit. Don't, don't do anything, just be present with however it is. 
for some people, the temptation to make sense of what happened or interpret it is very strong. If that occurs, then you do another pet. Because all, <clears throat> excuse me, all these habitual formations will simply bind you into duality. They are not in themselves bad. They are not the enemy. The, the problem is the, the fusional force that comes from, from the ego to the object. The ego longs for belonging, like a child lost in a big shop, crying mother. So whenever a thought or a feeling arises, the ego says, are you my mother? Are you my mother? It tries to hide inside this temporary formation. So this is how we use the pet. Okay. So in your own time, <clears throat> we we do this for maybe ten minutes and then have a break. Uh, re just sitting open and let the sound of pet arise and then stay very precisely present with whatever is there. Okay, so <clears throat> there, are <clears throat> there are many different ways in which you can come into relation with the mind itself. This, uh, the use of pet is to shock open so that there's a, like, a, in a, like a trauma reaction in a car crash, the mind seems to stop. It's the, the key point is always with these, we're not so much concerned with the method but with the consequence of the method. When the mind is open and <clears throat> the wrapping, the cocoon of conceptual elaboration hasn't yet started, there is a moment where you see the cocoon arises from the emptiness and not from outside. We have to remember there is no end to the movement of the mind. You can't destroy the mind. The mind is stillness and movement. Movement will always keep moving. The issue for us is to, in that moment, see the movement is the movement of the stillness. And the ego as a, a delusion, an illusion, a non-existent claiming an existent, always comes back in as an insertion from outside, as if it was not part of the movement of arising and passing. Oh, that's why we do the practice. To interrupt the activity of recovering, covering over again, the openness of the mind. Okay, if we take a break for maybe 15 minutes, and come back at half past. Okay, are we ready? Good. So then he says, fierce and abrupt, astonishing, emaho. Nothing at all free. Nothing at all <clears throat> means that the object vanishes. And so the subject has nothing to hold on to and it dissolves. The view of the mind as the empty quality from which uh, awareness shines forth in the Prajnaparamita literature is described as the, the great mother, the mother of all the Buddhas. Now, you imagine here is one mother with two children the object and the subject. Sometimes they play together in a useful way, but often not. <clears throat> they tend to go towards a confluence, which means 
coming together, which means incest, not happy for mama. And from the other side, when they don't get on well together, you have murder or suicide. One of them says, having you as my brother, it's too much, I, I'm, I die, I prefer to be dead. Or maybe I change my mind, fuck you, I kill you. And this is a conflict between subject and object going on all the time. This is one family. The Buddhas are very wise. And they design this kind of practice as a sort of family therapy. This is an unhappy family. Mom is tired. She tries again and again. She says, we're all empty. For fuck's sake, be kind to each other. But they don't listen to mom. They want to keep fighting. So when we do this practice, the pet takes out the object formation, the body, the environment, where you are, and the energy of the pet dissolves the subject at the same time. So, so then, when we rest in that open state, nothing at all free it means the subject and object are in the infinity. They are aspects of the infinity, and so they have no capacity to block infinity. This is open, free, unimpeded. Unimpeded means when you're sitting, different thoughts, feelings, sensations arise, but the seemingly continuous reference point of myself, I, me, myself, is gone. And so there is nothing to impede the arising and passing of whatever comes. From the point of view of empty awareness, no thought brings any advantage or disadvantage. This is uncontrived equanimity. Contrived equanimity is when we try to balance things and to be even and so on, but it's a lot of work. Here it's just immediate. And it's inexpressible. <clears throat> Language is a means of talking about things. It needs something. It needs subject, verb, object in whatever order. Through this interactions, patterns of meaning are developed. But in the face of nothing, which is radiant and shining, it's not nothing at all. It's all of this empty. There's nothing to say. In the next line is interesting. <clears throat> it says, clearly identify this as your own Dharmakaya awareness. Because when he's talking about uh, at this stage, he's talking about um, an experience of the path that we are trying to clarify this for ourselves. So when you do the pet and it's open, <clears throat> if we, if a, if if the attitude "what is this" arises, this is a separative formation. The what is putting it something over there. You might think, oh, that was strange. What was that for? So he's saying clearly, don't do this. Don't follow any kind of commentary or inquiry that would turn that experience into something. This is you. Nothing bright. This is you. So he says, identify this as your own Dharmakaya awareness. That is to say, the quality of awareness not different from that of the Buddhas. So here, the key issue, as we've touched on already, is not looking in the manner of looking for something, but looking at the looker and seeing that the looker is not different from the looking. Normally we're looking out through our senses. We're sniffing the air, we're hearing sounds. So it's like subject goes out of the sense pathways to the objects of the world. And this feeds our thoughts, feelings, and sensations about the world. But 
what we want to do is to look at the looker. This sounds like something impossible. If I look at the looker, then I see my face looking out, but I'm still not the face looking out. So when we do this, pop, there is a presence or a looking or a, an awareness looking out, as it were, open out, and see it without seeing anything. It's not an object. It's not a thing. You are not a thing. You can produce things. You can fabricate all kinds of appearances and memories and so on as, as kind of simulacrum of something truly existing. But from the very beginning, nothing has truly existed. So now you're sitting and all of this is here. All of this includes the body. You're not someone located inside the body looking out, but your own body is the movement of the energy of the mind within the mind. The mind is infinite, it means undivided, not inside and outside. The ego is finite. Now we make the sound of pet and it's open. I am the openness, I see the openness, I see with the openness. So this is the first of the three statements of Garab Dorji to be introduced to your own mind. You know how to introduce a person to another person. You say, John, this is Bill. Bill well, likes to ride bicycles and so do you. People say that kind of thing. Someone is introduced to someone. But now your someone is being introduced to no one and this no one is the truth of your someone. And in that moment, you see, I, I'm not a thing. Experiences are continuing to arise. Perceptions through the senses, memories, plans, and they're moving. They're moving in the shining, lucid arena of the mind. It's clear without me clarifying it. It is intrinsically clear. So that means have many, many terms for these kind of things. Sometimes they say clear light, sometimes um, clarity and emptiness. In this openness, the tendency to gather oneself as this particular individual self continues to present itself as a potential site of identification. Now, this ego has no shape or form of its own. It finds shape by fusion. Find, it finds shape by fusion. This means I can identify with anything. And we know this. Sometimes when you're sitting in a meditation, there is a kind of sensation in your head. You might think, oh, this is, this is me. This is a reminder of me, my head. You can identify with sounds outside because there are some familiar noise of the church bells ringing or muezzin calling. This is me. It's not you. There is you. You is the appropriating statement of identification. The ego thinks and talks itself into existence. So this, uh, this part of the text is completely necessary for meditators. Your mind, sorry, on you go. Your mind is a dharmakaya. Your mind is open like the blue sky. The cloud arises. The sky is open. The cloud is in the sky. It's not attacking the sky. It's non-dual with the sky. 
as in the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. The sky is the cloud, the cloud is the sky. The thought is the Dharmakaya. There is no enemy, there is no limitation. So maybe you're sitting in the practice and you think, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like me. Nothing's changed. This is a sequence of thoughts. The thoughts arise and move and gone. Nothing is established. But as the thought goes by, it gives a little caress to the ego. The thought says, don't worry, sweetie, I believe in you. And in that way, the ego prepares to re-enter in terms of claiming identification. So the, the use of pet is to establish the sky free of clouds for a moment. It's not that the sky is better than the clouds. The problem is when you become so intoxicated with the clouds, you forget the sky. So in this way, then now we're sitting and whatever is arising is the movement of the Buddha mind. Happy, sad, excited, bored. Stay relaxed and open. That means don't do anything. It's not that you have to try to stay. It means don't run around. Don't get carried away. You feel bored, you feel stupid, and you're sitting. This feeling goes through you, cloud in the sky. This is a cloud. When the cloud dissolves, the sky is there. The cloud cannot contaminate the sky. I can't meditate, I'm stupid, other people understand these things. These are clouds. Don't try to get rid of them. Don't merge yourself with them. Just let them come and go. But I feel out of control. Oh, that's a good sign. Because you're not in control. You never have been in control. You never will be in control. But there's a sense of outrage. I'm not in control. I should be in control. I'm going to be the kind of person I want to be. This is the recipe for total stupidity. You are co-emergent with your environment. People smile at you and you feel happy. Someone looks at you with a sour face and you feel unhappy. So great controller of your existence. How are you doing? Control is an illusion. The ego seeks control because it has absolutely no control. Whereas when we are the presence of awareness, we are working with circumstances. Neither in control nor out of control. But balancing, unbalancing, balancing, unbalancing. So that deeper and deeper we feel the intrinsic balance and harmony of groundedness. So he says, revelation of your original face directly to yourself is the first key point. Your original face means how you have been from the very beginning. Through your life, your face has changed from childhood to adulthood and so on. The original face is our mind itself, is like mirror-like presence of awareness. And this is revealed to us when we offer ourselves to it. The naked mind finds the naked mind. If two people meet together and one takes their clothes off and the other keeps their clothes on, the clothed person tends to have more power. Then nakedness is a, a quality of vulnerability. But if both people have their clothes off, there is less vulnerability. Both 
are hoping for some kind of love or closeness. So in the same way, when you are covered in your habits, your clothing of thoughts, memories, plans, your sense of who you are, how, how are you going to get close to this for always naked sky-like awareness? Awareness is not covered in anything. So it's like that. We reveal ourselves to ourselves by becoming open and empty. This is how we find our mind. Not by studying books, not by thinking and analyzing our existence, but simply spending time with ourselves as we are. As you're sitting, thoughts, feelings arise. You can use them to construct an image of who you take yourself to be. That way leads into further limitation. Or you simply watch how it happens. This is here and now it's gone. This is here and now it's gone. You sit in your body but your body is not one thing. Sometimes maybe your back feels a bit tight. Then your bum feels a bit sore because it's pressing on the seat. Then you become aware of your breathing. Your body aspects are moving in and out of your attentive awareness. That way you see, oh, my body is not a thing. It's not something I have. It's energy revealing itself, but not in a straight line. You want to be quiet. Somebody sent a little message saying that next door to where they are, there is a wedding party. These things happen. There is sudden disturbance. That's part of our world, not an attack on our world. Open awareness allows noisy neighbors, but it makes it more difficult for me. Oh, open awareness says, oh, poor, sad little girl, there's room for you too. Everything is welcome. Space for everything as it is. Because everything which arises, passes. When you stop seeing everything in terms of how it impacts you as this concretized ego, it's just passing through then it's the richness of your world. Sounds, smells, tastes, coming, going, coming, going, like a, a beautiful pageant, like a royal procession. Okay, so then he says, then whether your mind is busy or settled, angry or desireful, happy or sad, at all times and in all situations, Recognize yourself as Dharmakaya. So this is just what I was describing. Now, Dharmakaya is equanimous, equanimity itself, equanimous. It has no bias. And it doesn't organize things hierarchically. Everything is illuminated by the light of the Dharmakaya. So, Anger is also the energy of the Dharmakaya, as is sadness, as is being very busy or being anxious. This seems stupid or mad to the ego. The ego says, I don't want to be sad. I want to be happy. Everyone knows happiness is better than sadness. And the Buddha agrees. He said, yes, everyone in samsara agrees that happiness is better than sadness. Here in Buddha land, we don't quite think that way. Everything is the radiance of the mind. As the great uh, Namkai Norbu said again and again, do not enter into judgment. Judgment is always relative to your ego positioning. What is the best kind of ice cream? Everybody has some idea, but these, these ideas are not the truth for anyone else except us. 
they come and they go. They don't establish anything. If you see that, someone likes strawberry ice cream, someone likes vanilla. This is a moment of experience. Nothing is established, arising and passing, just passing through. So then we start to stay close to our own experience. I don't like being sad. That's a thought. How are you when you're sad? I just don't like it. No, but how are you when you're sad? What is the phenomenology of sadness? If you stay close to the sadness as it is, it's vanishing. It's always vanishing. Oh, this is at the heart of it. This is why you can say that anger and sadness and jealousy and pride are the Dharmakaya. Because anger is a pattern of energy without individual essence, manifesting without existing. The same for everything. And another name for manifesting without existing is the energy of the, the Dharmakaya. Oh, that's why he says it's, it's so beautiful, the text. Whatever is happening, don't fall out of this open spacious awareness. Don't collapse into identification with sadness. But recognize everything as the play of the energy of your own mind. When we say of your own mind, it doesn't mean, wow, James, what an amazing mind you have. My mind is not mine. My mind is what shows me. I am the child of my mind. Without the mind, I wouldn't be here talking blah, blah to you. And in talking, the body is moving, the lungs are moving, everything is moving. This is our connectivity together, which is a flow. So maybe sometimes you're bored this afternoon, maybe sometimes it's interesting, you have fluctuations of mood. This is all your experience. If you, if you merge your mind with one particular experience, then this combination can solidify. Oh my God, so many words, so many ideas. I'm not going to be there tomorrow. I'm going to have a, a long sleep. Enough is enough. That, that's a thought. You're welcome to have the thought if you like. But if you recognize the thought as the energy of the Dharmakaya, you can be present tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock London time. But if you think, no, this thought tells me the truth about me, I say thank you and goodbye. I'm going. Where are you going? Somewhere better. Somewhere with strawberry ice cream. This is the mind. Not something mystical and hidden. The mind shows itself. What looks like a prison is itself free. It's not about the object. It's how you take the object. You don't need to take the object. If you don't take the object, there is no object to be taken. The act of taking freezes the flow of experience, concretizing it into something. But this is just a melange of sensation, feeling, memory, thought, and so on. It's only truth is your belief in it. So in that point, you can see, oh, the door to freedom is always with me. Free or trapped, moment by moment, is there. Then he says, the already acquainted mother and child clear lights meet. The mother means the intrinsic clarity of the mind itself. The mother is always there before the child. The child comes after the mother. So when we do the practice, the practice quality manifests as the, the child. 
child. Now, without mother, there is no child. The lonely hero says, it's all up to me. I have to find my way to enlightenment. But that's not what the text is saying. Because your mind has been pure from the very beginning, because clear light or intrinsic illumination has been part of the ground awareness from the very beginning, when you stop obscuring this intrinsic light and you obscure it by your addiction to merging into thoughts and feelings and making them substantial, by not obscuring the intrinsic light, this in itself is the child light, which is inseparable from the mother. That's how they meet. You are the emergence of the light of the mind. You laugh, walk, you smell flowers. You go in the shop and you look at a pretty dress and you think, could I wear it or not? Each of these moments is the energy of the mind manifesting. It's bad enough that you think you know who you are, but if on top of that you think you know who the Buddha is, and you're sure, you're absolutely sure that the Buddha has no interest in pretty dresses, then clearly you're going to be in samsara a long time. The Buddha is omniscient means he knows about lipstick, earrings, football boots. Everything is the display of the energy of the Buddha mind. The only way to find this is to make use of one of the practices here, this pet practice, to open the space in which the unborn mind is revealed directly to itself. And then as you do less, and less construction and production, you receive more. And as you receive more, what is arising is the light of the ground. And then your child light and the light of the mother will come together. Okay, that's uh, maybe enough for today. And for those who wish, tomorrow morning, uh, 10 o'clock uh, London time, we will continue. It's very interesting <clears throat> to spend time in this strange way with you. We are both connected and disconnected by Zoom. The key thing is not to make some judgment about it, but gradually we find our way into uh, somehow uh, having it function. So this is all we can do. And many people from different countries with different background languages gradually have some more interest in uh, awakening to how they are. This is not a religion with uh, membership cards. The teaching is simply a mirror in which you might be able to glimpse yourself. We are like this, we are like this, we are like this. <coughs> so we keep looking. And the truth of the text and the truth of our life will come together. So, have a good evening and we meet tomorrow, if we do. Bye. And thanks very much to our translators and to our technicians who have kept this great vehicle of Dharma moving uh, easily and bumpily, both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. International. Thank you. 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 Thank you.